Hi everyone, thank you for joining us again and I want to continue to thank you for your support of watching our online um, service as well as your financial support and your prayers. All very, very much appreciated. Today we're going to be talking about starting over again and foundations. We're starting to talk a lot more about when we get back together again and what that's going to look like and how we're going to do it. I'm here at this barn. You can see behind. It's, it's in rough shape. It's taken a few hits. But the foundation, well, the foundation is solid. Reminded me a lot about Thamesview. We have come through a difficult time and are still recovering from that. But the foundation of our church, of history, of worship, of service, of witness, of fellowship, that's our foundation. And of course, built on our faith in God and Jesus Christ. What can be built again when we start over will be different. It will be new. Yeah, but sometimes new is an opportunity to do something even better. So as we look forward to getting together, that's what we're going to talk, start to talk about. Starting over again. How exciting that will be as we join together once again as Thamesview United Church. Hi Thamesview. I'm coming from a new location today. This is my living room. We just recently had um, our, a piano. We got a piano from Rick Rogozinski after he passed away. I managed to inherit it. And so it finally got tuned. We got a delay in getting it moved and getting it tuned because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So now we have access to this piano. So this week we're going to use it for our, our songs. Uh, it's in my living room. My living room kind of... I'm on a music stand here. Let's see if I can rotate this. So there, I have a view of London. You can see it behind me. I think it goes in and out, but that's fine. And then uh, that's my living room. And then I have a balcony over here on this side. There you go. I hope none of you are getting carsick uh, from that. Anyway, so... I'm going to start today, or I'm going to do this piece for you today called Standing on the Promises. It's an older hymn. Hopefully there's not too much glare off the top of my head here. I'll figure this out. I may have to change these angles, so we'll be, it will be experimental this week. Standing on the Promises. And I'll put the words up, hopefully. <laughs>
everyone. The psalm reading today is from Psalms 118, verses 19 to 24. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. And also reading from Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 2 verse 5 from the memoirs of Nehemiah. It was the month of Kislev in the 20th year. One of my brothers had just arrived from Judah with some fellow Jews. I asked them about the conditions among the Jews who, were, who had survived the exile and about Jerusalem. They told me the survivors are left there in the province are in bad shape. Conditions are appalling. The wall of Jerusalem is still rubble. The city gates are still cinders. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. I mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, God, great and awesome God, loyal to your covenant and faithful to those who love you and obey your commands, look at me, listen to me, pay attention to this prayer of your servant that I'm praying day and night in intercession for your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. We remember the warning you gave to your servant Moses. If you betray me, I'll scatter you to the four winds. But if you come back to me and do what I tell you, I'll gather up all these scattered peoples from wherever they ended up and put them back in the place I chose to mark with my name. O oh, Master, listen to me. Listen to your servant's prayer and make me successful today so that I get what I want from the king. Shortly afterward, while I was bringing him his wine, the king asked me why I looked so downcast. I said, Long live the king, and why shouldn't I be depressed when the city, the city where all my family is buried, is in ruins? and the city gates have been reduced to cinders. Then the king asked me, so what do you want? Praying under my breath to God, I said, if it please the king, send me to Judah, to the city where my family is buried, so that I can rebuild it. The book of Nehemiah is a book of memoirs by a man who wasn't a prophet or a priest just a layman who wanted to tell that God was going to do something important, some leadership stuff for his people who were far away. I read a story about something that happened a few years ago at the University of Texas. It had become a tradition at the time when the football season started that the students would build a huge bonfire. They would create it and engineer it and stack the wood and they would light the fire and go through the whole thing of remembering the pride they had of being a student or an alumni member. And for years everything went really well until one November when they were laying the third layer of logs stacked up on end out in the open field where it had always been done, something snapped and then moved and then the pile collapsed and several students were injured and some were killed. It was a terrible tragedy for the university and the town. It clouded the rest of the school year and the whole state of Texas mourned because this tragedy had happened. It had blackened something that had been such a wonderful tradition. It was sometime later that the president of the university made the announcement, we're going to start over. We're going to do it again. But he added it was going to be two years without a bonfire only a memorial service for those who had lost their lives. But he assured them they would start the fire again. They would light it again. They would celebrate the bonfire once more in three years. They'd start slowly and they would start correctly. And they would do it all over again. Experts and engineers would be called in. Good planning and decisions would be made about starting over sadness and tragedy and the consequences of what parents, students and the alumni had to go through would still be talked about and acknowledged. Healing and rebuilding would still be needed, but starting over was important. Starting over had to happen for the tradition to go on. 
starting over again is part of our lives. If you're a believer and if you trust in Jesus Christ, if you love God with everything you have, then you don't have a choice but to start over and over and over after any of the setbacks that you have in your life. Because you're a human being. And human beings, like bonfires with stacks of logs, fall over and fail. We blow it. We sin. We rebel against God. We face tragedies and hardships and pandemics. But the news of the Old Testament to the New, from the beginning of Scripture to the end of it, is that God is a God of people who start over. And that's shown to us here in the book of Nehemiah. This is a picture of hope and renewal and starting up again and rebuilding. You see, at this point, Nehemiah, in effect, is crushed by some news. Fifteen years before, Ezra had led a contingent of Jews back to the Promised Land, and they had been given permission not only to go, but also given the resources to do some rebuilding. Yet when they got there, they were seen by the locals as threatening. And we know from the New Testament that the Samaritans were not in favor of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. So they got the king to sign a formal notice that no rebuilding would be allowed in Jerusalem. The Samaritans said, those Jews were rebels. And if you give them a surrounded city, a safe city, they'll rebel against you, O king. You're going to have a rebellion on your hands. So the king said, okay, no rebuilding. No allowing the people to put the wall back together or to replace the burned gates or rebuild the temple. It can't be done. I'm issuing my royal edict. Nothing may change. Well, the messengers came to Nehemiah, who had risen through the ranks and was now close to the king, had gained the king's ear, apparently, over the years by serving him. And Nehemiah was crushed by the news. He took it very personally. It's not just some Jews 200, 300 miles from here. He said, these are people that are part of my family, my brothers and sisters. We serve the same God. We come from the same roots. We have the same spiritual genetics running through us and running through our hearts. And they're in disgrace. And therefore, so am I. Brokenness had taken place. There was failure. And these people that had started off with hope were now living in rubble. They weren't safe, and they weren't happy. And there was nothing good happening there. Nothing was the way it used to be, so they felt so uncertain about what was coming. Sound familiar? <laughs> you ever feel that way? You ever look around and say, it feels like our life, like our way of living, or at least the way we want, the way we want to live our lives is in tatters. It's depressing. We're not happy. I know that I have often felt that way in the past five months. Well, that's what Nehemiah felt in his bones, and he grieved over it. In fact, we know he grieved for months. He fasted and he cried. He wept and he talked to God. That was good stuff, by the way. We need to grieve when things are broken, when life falls apart, when there is a crash, when there is a fall and disappointment. We need to say, it happened. Stuff undealt with, other challenges completely out of your control, pieces of our lives that are broken down and left to pile, they just create more problems and insecurities. And we need to just look at it and say, this is our situation. And we're feeling broken and a little lost. Nehemiah did that. He grieved, but then he did something about it. He prayed. And during those months of praying, he began to think about what could be. Not what was, not what used to be, but what could be. Is it possible to build a city out of rubble? A land that can be safe. A city that can learn from what happened. A temple within which they can safely worship and honor God again. After all this time, this separation and isolation, is this something we can do? Nehemiah reasons, could I do it? Could I be part of this? God, what are you saying to me? 
Am I supposed to go back to being part of a new community, a restored community? But I'm getting used to how it's become now. It's, it's kind of comfortable. I've got it good. I can be a witness right here where I am in my house. Do you want me to go there and do this and serve that way? Well, God starts to talk and Nehemiah starts thinking about what can be. He starts to believe and hear from God about starting over. And in his prayer, now it's very interesting, I think, to read this prayer, there is a magnification of God's name and then there is confession, very necessary as a way to begin again. But then he does something else. He says, you told us we could start again. Did you catch those words? They're actually a quote from Deuteronomy. Verse 8, remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. It's going to happen. But if you return and obey my commands, even if you're exiled to the farthest nation, I'll gather you back together. I'll bring you back. It's important to realize as individuals and as a church, we have come through and continue to go through a time of real struggle. It's even more important that we realize that God knows all about it because God has been through it with us. What a God we serve. This God prepares for the grief, prepares for the rebellion, prepares for the walls and the lives as well as cities to break down and bust and burn. And as God prepares for it by giving us a promise that when there is a return and an expected faith, there will be grace and joy. This, we believe, points to Jesus because all salvation is through him. We have this cornerstone, as the Bible calls him. The cornerstone that was rejected and put down and ignored. But if we're going to rebuild, he is the one to rely on. Our foundation. He is the one we go to. He is the one who, at the bottom of the wall, gives strength and direction for the rebuilding process. He is the standard bearer of God's grace. He is the faithful forgiver. He is our great redeemer. Prayers are throughout the whole diary of Nehemiah. But this one is the best, I think. Verse 4, where it says, The king said to me, What is it you want? What's next in the whole crux of rebuilding? Nehemiah prayed and worked. I love that it says that. He worked and prayed. He prayed through his work and in his words and in his leadership, and he grew. He got angry over injustice. He gained power in leadership. He helped the people around him. And he said, let's rebuild the walls. Let's all of us get to work. And he did all this with prayer. That's how all of us should prepare for the reopening of our communities and of our church. We can pray. Before the first and second chapter of Nehemiah are over, Nehemiah says in his prayers that the king has power, but it is God who works through him. I have power, the king says, to rebuild, but it is God who's going to rebuild and rebuild us. Through the prayer, God takes the central position. Through prayer, God takes rocks and scattered mortar and a crumbled community and rebuilds. God does this through us and in us. He promised that he would in answer to our prayers. We already have a foundation. Christ is our firm foundation of our church and of our faith. We don't start from scratch. And as we prepare for the fall and eagerly anticipate the day when we can gather together again and start up our programs and join in worship and fellowship in God's house and build up Thamesview United Church once again, Will you start to pray with me now? And will you keep on praying? Because, beloved church, that is the only way we are going to be able to start over. And I'm really looking forward to that day.
Hi, Tensu. We're going to sing another great hymn of the church, the church's one foundation, who is Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we realize there are many people whose lives have been tremendously altered by COVID-19 in these past months. Some who are coping with grief, others with loneliness, some with sickness, almost all with isolation and uncertainty. And now we're beginning to open up to a new kind of normal and we have to start over. There are some parents who look at their own kids today and wonder what will be happening to their education or with their sports and activities. Will they be safe? Can we keep them happy and secure? Will their teachers be safe? We still worry about our seniors and those who are the most at risk to still get sick. Are we doing enough protecting them off, still communicating and connecting enough? Are we looking after our neighbors and friends and families enough? Are we even looking after ourselves enough? Are we being respectful and careful to do all that we can to continue to suppress this virus from others? And have we learned lessons that we can continue as we start again? Caring for our environment, supporting local business, being honest as we examine our own prejudices and bigotries. Lord, we look at our lives and the condition of the world and we sometimes say, this is a pile of rubble if I've ever seen one. So God, come and begin a new work. Bring renewal and change. Clear the rubble, stack the stones, set the gates, 
Revive our church, change our world, our hearts, and our lives as we start again, Lord, please. Because you care and because you promised. For we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hi, Tim Sue. Today we're going to sing an, a hymn that we sing quite often in church, How Firm a Foundation. And I'm going to experiment with some organ sounds and put the words there. So you have to make sure you sing along. And when we get to the last verse, I'm going to have a nice big pipe organ sound. And the very last line says, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. And I want to hear you all the way here in London. Thank you. 